Did anybody else feel just a little down this week now that the Olympics are over? You know, for a couple of weeks, every couple of years, we are immersed in this concentrated showcase of human talent and achievement. People doing things faster, higher, stronger, and now with a new word added to the Olympic motto, faster, higher, stronger, together. And there is something about this experience that does bring us together. I got so invested in the men's volleyball gold medal match. I was cheering for France to win. I don't normally have much connection to the French except to their fries, but for some reason I was totally in. Peppered into the Olympics are the stories, the stories of the people who are involved, who have overcome sometimes great adversity, like Ezequias Caros de Santos, who was burned by boiling water. He was kidnapped and lost a kidney before winning the canoe sprint gold. Or Caleb Dressel and his interview after winning the 100 freestyle. This strong, almost superhuman guy, just weeping, not real, really able to, to hold it together. I like to think of the Olympics as the real reality TV. And that's because the real achievement happens before the TV cameras start rolling. At our house, we have some sense of what it takes to make that level of athletic performance come together. We were so proud of my son Luke for going to the Olympic trials and swimming this year. And what we can tell you is that it is not just one thing that gets you there. It is a whole, whole bunch of things. Natural talent, hard work, setting goals, lots of sleep, what you eat, what you drink, social support, family commitment, financial commitment, physical therapy, mental focus, not doing a whole lot of other things so that you can focus. And the truth is life presents all of us with the daily challenges that these athletes have. And we all have to figure out how all those little daily decisions that we make and the actions that we put together add up to a life of significance and purpose. This is what I think Jesus really means when he says to seek first God's kingdom and God's righteousness. It's not that God is first, so to speak, as we sometimes say, as if God could be on a priority list and we could segment out life and it would be God first, then family, then work, and on and on. That, that may be true in some sense, but seeking first God's kingdom is more integrated than that. It has more to do with the daily desire to find the presence and activity of God in every aspect of life. It's putting a program together uh, so that we can achieve the right thing. Seek first means to look for God's kingdom, to look for God's righteousness, breaking into all of life, to join that in everyday life. Seek first means to become aware of what is there and we miss, to be attentive first to God to find that first and then work it out from there, to gain the ability to participate in the life of eternity now, to look for and to desire this above absolutely everything else. So to seek first God's kingdom means to transform everyday life at the desire level, at the want to level. It is to reshape our desires, not to tamp them down, but to focus them, to intensify them, and to set loftier goals. John Stott writes this, such a desire will start with ourselves until every single department of our life, our home, marriage, family, personal morality, professional life, and business ethics, bank balance, tax returns, lifestyle, citizenship, is joyfully and freely brought into an integrated whole. One of the things that I've always said to my kids in their athletic achievements is this, I will never want it more than you do. And what I mean by that is that ultimately the passion and the desire and the responsibility, the wins and the losses and the motivation and what it takes to put it all together must come from you. 
If you wanna align your life around this worthy goal, then you're gonna have to bring that to the equation. Nobody else can do that for you. I will never want it more than you do. And I think Jesus, in a sense, is saying something similar to us. The ultimate motivation arises in us as we discover the true value of God and the things of God. And then as we each decide if we wanna put our lives together for that thing, to seek that first in every aspect of life, above all else, whether that is worth aligning all of life around, whether that is a worthy goal of giving our lives away to and giving our lives away to God and to one another. Maybe what is the greatest surprise in this kind of seeking and this kind of alignment and this kind of integration is just that it is a good thing. It's a thing of joy, not a burden, a thing of peace more than the struggle we learn that it is actually more life-giving to live this way, to give rather than to receive. We learn that ordinary life is full of all kinds of joys and surprises that were right there under our noses before we started looking for them. What used to cause us worry, what used to bring anxiety, is now even that incorporated into a life of peace. Not life one day in heaven, but life, the life of eternity now. As someone has said, not pie in the sky, but ham where I am. Brother Lawrence is uh, famous for writing in the late 1600s about living a life in God's presence. He wrote that our wholeness is not so much about changing what we do, but why we do it. It is not so much doing things for God as much as doing for God what we used to do for ourselves. Brother Lawrence was a disabled monk. He worked in a kitchen and he became well known for his ability to do even the most menial, menial task for God and in the continual presence of God. This is what he writes. The time of business does not with me differ from the time of prayer and in the noise and clatter of my kitchen, while several persons are at the same time calling for different things, I possess God in as great tranquility as if I were on my knees at the blessed sacrament. Redeeming our routines means seeking the kingdom of God in our daily lives, in the noise and in the quiet, in the daily relationships of home and work in the cooking of dinner and the doing of homework and in the doing of housework and in the dr driving our cars from here to there. Seeking first the kingdom means expecting to find God here in those daily rhythms of our lives. Not necessarily doing new things for God, but doing what we used to do for ourselves for God. It's expecting to find God now, not later. It's expecting to find God in the ordinary moments. In fact, it's the realization that if we can't make the connection between God and doing the dishes, chances are we're not going to be able to make that connection anywhere. An Olympic athlete, athlete is defined more by those daily choices and the daily rhythms than that moment standing on a podium. And so it is with us. We too are defined, our lives are defined by seeking God's kingdom in the rhythms of daily life. And that's what we mean by redeeming the routines. That's the goal that we are setting for ourselves in this time as we are trying to rebuild our lives after so much disruption. And it's the hope that we gather in, that we would be able to find God's kingdom if we look for it if we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, that we will find it in our ordinary lives. So why don't we? Why don't we? I have some thoughts about that. First, I want us to think about how we are often distracted rather than present. If we're going to find the kingdom of God, we're going to find it here, right here in this moment and nowhere else. And yet very often and increasingly, we have every excuse to be somewhere else, anywhere else than actually present where we are. It's, it's a trapping of modern life. Technology probably has a lot to do with it. Uh, it, has, it plays a major role in our distractedness. I listened to an interview last week with Michael Sacassis, who 
has a list of 41 questions everyone should ask about the technologies, technologies they're using. So Cassis wants to make us aware of how technology changes our lives and not necessarily to, to criticize or to critique, but just to help us be aware. And one of the things that he brings up is that technology makes it harder for us to be present. Harder for us to be connected to our bodies and just to, to be, be here where we are. And it's not just, it's not just that we're all staring at our phones. Any technology can have this impact and we just need to be aware of it. Things like GPS and Google cause us to rely on a technology rather than on each other to figure out some of the basic things like where are we going or what is the information that we need to know. We used to go and ask grandma and grandpa, now we go to Google. And they also challenge our ability to be present in a place where we are. GPS is great. There's a lot less anxiety in my life when I'm trying to get somewhere, when, when I don't know where I'm going. When I get frustrated, I yell at Siri now and not the person holding the map. Not all of this is bad. But I think of those early explorers who sailed their way around the world just by looking at the stars. I'm guessing not many of us can do that anymore. In most of human history, it has been a great advantage to be aware of your surroundings. But I'm not sure that's so these days. Each day we are bombarded by thousands of reasons not to be aware of our surroundings. We have chosen by our own decisions, convenience and efficiency over presence and awareness. The writer Wendell Berry is famous for having written everything he has ever written out longhand. He rejected the technological advance of the typewriter years ago. And his reason? Well, he says that he writes too fast as it is. Even writing each word out by hand, he is still in need of slowing down. You know, Jesus was concerned about our ability to be present long before these technological advances, before the smartphone or the typewriter or indoor plumbing. Consider the lilies of the field, he said. Consider the birds of the air. They are beautiful and they are valuable to God. If so with them, how much more so with us? In the lockdown phase of 2020, some barn swallows made a nest on our porch. We very quickly became very invested in the lives of these little birds. Here's a picture of the daddy bird this year, actually, when they came back for round two on our porch. You know, it looks like one of those memes that says, I've been trying to reach you uh, to talk to you about your car's extended warranty. But anyway, we watched these birds every day as they raised five babies last year and three this year. We became invested in their daily lives and so did our two cats. And we learned a little bit about what Jesus might have meant when he talked about those birds of the air. In fact, we learned what he didn't mean. It's not that they don't work like we do because they do. They build their little mud and twig nests diligently on a very safe spot in our porch. And it's not that they don't have responsibilities like we do, they do. They have great responsibility and are so attentive to their babies and to each other. And about the time those little ones are ready to fly, then the whole flock come, comes out of nowhere. And all of them fly around and encourage and sort of watch over those babies as they're learning to fly and they incorporate them into their flock. And it's not even that those little birds don't have trouble because they do. Our two outside cats are a constant source of frustration for them. And so they respond by dive bombing the cats all day long. And the cats learn to make a path through the shrubs or under cover and would never go out into the open yard because they will get it from every angle. So those little birds have all the work and all the responsibility and all the trouble that you do. But what Jesus is saying is that they don't have something that you do. It's a word that we translate as worry or distraction or being unable to be present in the moment because we're distracted by something else. It's the same word that Jesus uses when he talks to Martha. And Martha is hosting Jesus in her home and she's working so hard as a hostess and her sister Mary is sitting at Jesus's feet. 
So Martha tries to enlist Jesus in setting Mary straight, to, to have Mary join her in running around and being frazzled and distracted. But Jesus says no. That in fact, Mary has chosen the better way. And it's not because Mary isn't working, it's because Mary isn't distracted and frazzled. Martha's life is not characterized by integration and peace. Instead, she is worried and distracted about many things. This is the same word that Jesus uses in a parable that he tells. He talks, talks about a sower who throws out seeds on different kinds of soils. And some of that seed falls onto weedy ground, ground with a lot of weeds in it. And at first those plants do fine. They come up and they're healthy, but eventually the weeds also come up and those healthy plants are choked out by the cares or the worries of the world. Corey Timboom wrote, worry doesn't empty tomorrow of its sorrow, it empties today of its strength. Another reason that is related why we don't experience God in everyday life is this, that we are compartmentalized rather than integrated. What we mean by that is that we have parts of our lives that we think are more holy and godly and other parts that are ordinary, that we have sort of a spiritual DNA, a way of thinking about things that's, that's wrong, that, a lens over life that we need to remove. And part of seeking the kingdom of God is putting on a better way of seeing. Some things in life are sacred and some are secular. It's not, it's not the way Jesus talked. It's not true. It is all God's. In fact, Jesus wants us to find the kingdom in every aspect of life. He, he, he said in the Sermon on the Mount, to bring in your kingdom is, is a prayer that we should all be praying. Let your kingdom come. Bring in your kingdom so that your will is done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day the bread we need for today. It means that our daily living is really the place where we ask for God to enter in, even in the most basic ways, in relying on God daily for bread, making the connection between our most basic needs and our most sustaining relationship, the one who provides for those needs. Jesus also said, therefore, I say to you, don't worry about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink or about your body, what you'll wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothes? You know, sadly, there is a strong thread in the Christian tradition that we've just gotten wrong. We've read these scriptures to mean that our bodies and our food and our clothing are the problem. We have this false dualism that we bring to that scripture between the physical things and the spiritual things in life. But you can't actually separate your life in this way. It doesn't actually play out your physical life from your spiritual life. Your body isn't bad. Look at the scripture again. It doesn't say that your life is less than food or your body is less than clothes. Our lives aren't less than we make them out to be. No, they are more than we make them out to be. A sense of the sacredness and the importance, we might say, of our regular lives is essential to getting this life right. A sense of the sacredness and the importance of our physical bodies is actually the root of all Christian ethics. Our physical bodies are made in the very image of God. Jesus came and took on a physical body. Our future is in resurrected physical bodies. Embodiment, a bodily connection to this earth is the foundation of all Christian ethics, everything that we do. Listen to this in the high calling of embodied life that we read from Paul in 1 Corinthians to help us understand our sexual ethic. Or don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Don't you know that you have the Holy Spirit from God 
and you don't belong to yourselves. You have been bought and paid for. So honor God with your body. The point that Jesus is making is not that we need to reject the role of ordinary bodily life, but that we need to honor God with it. That we need to incorporate ordinary bodily life into an integrated whole. This includes our eating, our exercise, our physical relationships, our financial health, our sleep, our overall health, our daily living, our meal times, our screen time, our nap time, our downtime, and our ordinary times. If we're going to redeem our routines, it will have to start with incorporating all of life, not segmenting it. In this series, we wanted to find people who are living out the thing that we are talking about. And so we are going to hear from Joy Graham, who has found this ability to integrate physical health and exercise and her relationships with other people and her relationship with God into this one really compelling whole. If you know Joy, she is both the mo- probably the person that would challenge you the most physically. Anybody who's had her as a trainer uh, knows that she means business. And you will also know that she's living it herself and that she makes you better just being around her. So let's watch together. I taught school for 30 years and retired, but I've always, in conjunction to teaching school, been in fitness. Fitness has always been very important to me, or keeping your body healthy. And um, I basically, I I try to help people get healthy and do that through movement and um, nutrition and, you know, try to change their life, really. It's trying to get them to see their self-worth and to see that, you know, their body is important and that God is, you know, is, thinks their body is important. And, you know, we want to use it for um, the goodness of God. I think the number one is just time. The excuse of, you know, I don't have time for it. But my, my thinking is you may, never, you may never get this time again, so why not do it now? You know, it doesn't take a lot of time. 10, 15 minutes a day really is all you need to get moving. Um, But the other part would be, you know, maybe having children or having a really stressful job. But to be honest, all those things, you know, stress, um, you know, health, your diet, all that comes hand in hand. So, you know, if you want, you want to sleep better, you want better moods, you want... Uh, your family to be healthy, you want to um, be that example, then then do it now. And as you progress, it'll become a lifestyle change. And it'll be so natural that you won't have to, you won't have to be asking for help. You'll be helping other people do it. You start small. Always start in, you know, with something small. You set one goal. If that's, you know, if your goal is to to move for 30 minutes a day, then you set that goal that's doable. You know, maybe it's walking 30 minutes a day, maybe it's riding a bike, but it's something small. And then you kind of build off of it. So you don't have to start big. Like somebody who wants to run a 5K, you don't get up and just go out and run a 5K because you're not gonna wanna do it the next day. So it's gotta be something that you can keep coming back to. They know I'm gonna be there and they know I'm gonna listen to them. That might be an important part of it too. So, um, you know, I'm not just being their fitness instructor, I'm being their friend. If they wanna have a prayer request, I'll pray with them. I mean, it's it, it, there's a lot of things that go into, it's a relationship just like you have a relationship with a, any, anybody else. It's, it's mental, it's social, it's physical, it's everything, it's spiritual. Um, you put it all together because that's how your life is. The prayer, the, the you know, social aspect of it is all important too. So it's not like you come at eight o'clock and nine o'clock you're done. It might be you come a little early and you need to talk to me. Okay, you know, we talk. Maybe we need to talk the whole hour. I don't know. You know, it it may not always include 
exercise. I'm going to guarantee it probably does. But, you know, I mean, I can't say that it always will. There may be somebody who's just really going through a tough time. And it's just a time to listen and let them, you know, vent. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be another profession, but I think it's just knowing that they can trust you, um, count on you, and um, share their life with you. May, you know, some of these people don't have anybody to share things with. So, um, and some of them don't have other people that they would pray with. So all those things I think are important. They all come together. I go by, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, Philippians 4.13. And I will say that to these, you know, to, to my friends. I'm more of a friend who just wants to see people be healthy and fit. And, and that everybody can be that way, you know, and it, it will change your life. It's gonna make you feel different and make your habits, your habits will change. There's one last reason why I think we don't experience God's kingdom in everyday life. I think it's just because we don't expect to. And ultimately what it means to seek first in his kingdom is to set that expectation that we're going to find God in everyday life. Most of us probably thought it would look different than it does. My friend Wayne was fond of saying, this is what a relationship with God looks like. Maybe not what we expected and doesn't maybe compare to somebody else's. But this, this is what a relationship with God looks like, and it is there if you look. You know, growing up, I um, would go hunt for mushrooms with my family. It was sort of a springtime ritual, uh, morels in the woods. And what I learned was uh, you would kind of go out in the woods and you would start looking around on the ground for these little things uh, that were growing, these little fungus that were growing, fungi were, that were growing in the leaves. And you would look and you would look and you would look and not find them. But eventually you would see one. And then this amazing thing happened. Once you were able to see one, you could look around. In fact, you could be surrounded by them. They were there the whole time. And you just couldn't see them. You didn't have the ability to see them. And so this is what it means to seek the kingdom of God is to gain this ability to see it's certainly not a problem of the kingdom not being there. It's the realization that the kingdom of God isn't found in the places that we thought it maybe we would find it. And it's the realization that we just don't have the ability to see. But as we begin to look, all of a sudden the world takes on a different frame. We begin to notice that God is there in all kinds of places and in all kinds of ways that we did not expect. And it's there in any act of love, in the response of generosity and amidst an attitude of scarcity, it's compassion in the face of enemies, it's honesty and vulnerability and courage, and it is awareness. It's in elevating our lives so that the, the life that we live in ordinary ways is brought into the light of God's presence. It's taking care of mundane tasks with a sense of connection to the salvation of God at work in the world. It's how we talk to our loved ones in unguarded moments and how we treat strangers. It's in taking naps and eating healthy food and taking care of our bodies. Barbara Brown Taylor has written this, to make bread or to make love, to dig in the earth or to feed an animal or cook for a stranger. These activities require no extensive commentary, no lucid theology. All they require is someone willing to bend, reach, chop, stir. Many, most of these tasks are so full of pleasure that there is no need to complicate things by calling them holy. And yet these are the same activities that change lives. Sometimes all at once and sometimes more slowly, the way dripping water changes stone. In a world where faith is often construed as a way of thinking, bodily practices remind us the, the willing that faith 
is a way of life. Maybe you have thought about your bodily life and your spiritual life as two separate things. But if you're going to redeem your routines, the routines of your daily life, you must start to bring them together. And so ask yourself these questions as we close up today. What part of my physical health needs to be cared for as part of my spiritual health? How am I using my body that reveals how it is a sacred gift from God? How am I using my body that is contrary to it as a sacred gift from God? How can one ordinary thing I do be elevated into the realm of a sacred practice this week? We began last week by uh, realizing that we need to get back in rhythm. And throughout this series, we're gonna do that through prayer. Actually, last week, we asked you to just learn to take a deep breath, breathe in the name of Jesus, and then breathe out and say, you have my attention. We're gonna keep that up. My My guess is it probably is gonna take more than just a week for you to get back into rhythm by saying just a single breath prayer, but keep it up. Find yourself in moments where you just need to be reminded of God's presence doing this almost without thinking, breathing in the name of Jesus and breathing out, you have my attention. And then some of you might wanna take sort of another step to take it up a notch, so to speak, and to incorporate your body into prayer this week. You might maybe open your hands while you sit and pray. You might kneel while you pray this week. Maybe even another level is to go on a walk, a prayer walk, where you bring your body into the equation and you celebrate God's goodness in nature. And it it would probably be pretty life-giving for you to do that. Some of us are ready for sort of the, the advanced level of this, where you might pray with your hands raised or outstretched or maybe face down before God. Whatever you choose to do, keep it up. We're gonna be redeeming the routines together in the next year. I wanna close with this prayer by Ted Loder that I've used often to remind me of the challenges of living in daily life and also living in God's presence. Let's pray together. Holy one, there is something I wanted to tell you. And there have been errands to run, bills to pay, arrangements to make, meetings to attend, friends to entertain, and I forget what it is I wanted to say to you. And mostly, I forget what I'm about or why, oh God. Don't forget me, please, for the sake of Jesus Christ. Eternal one, there is something I wanted to tell you, but my mind races with worrying and watching, with weighing and planning, with rutted slights and pothole grievances with leaky dreams and leaky plumbing and leaky relationships that I keep trying to plug up and my attention is preoccupied with loneliness, with doubt and with things that I covet. And I forget what it is I wanted to say to you and how to say it honestly or how to do much of anything. Oh God, don't forget me please for the sake of Jesus Christ. Almighty one, there is something I wanted to ask you, but I stumble along the edge of a nameless rage, haunted by a hundred floating fears of war, of losing my job, of failing, of getting sick and old, of loved ones dying. And I forget what it is, the real question that I wanted to ask. And I forget to listen anyway because you seem unreal or far away and I forget what it is I have forgotten. Oh God, don't forget me please for the sake of Jesus Christ. Oh Father in heaven, perhaps you've already heard what I wanted to tell you. What I wanted to ask in my blundering way is don't give up on me. Don't become too sad about me, but laugh with me and try again with me and I will with you too. Oh, Father in heaven, perhaps you've already heard what I wanted to tell you. What I I wanted to ask is forgive me, heal me, increase my courage, please. Renew in me a little of love and faith and a sense of confidence and a vision of what it might mean to live as though you were real and I mattered and everyone was sister and brother. 
What I wanted to ask for is peace, enough to want and work for more, for joy enough to share and for awareness that is keen enough to sense your presence here, now, there, then, and always. Amen.